Hallo und willkommen. Starting off the news this week, the world's average temperature hit an all-time high on July the 3rd, surpassing 17 degrees Celsius for the first known time. It is the highest recorded temperature since instrumental measurements began in the late 19th century and is attributed to the combined impact of the El Nino weather event and ongoing carbon dioxide emissions. This year has seen an alarming surge in land and sea temperatures across the board, with the planet seeing heat waves in Spain, several countries in Asia and the southern US, coupled with uncharacteristic marine heat waves in regions like the North Sea. The El Nino Southern Oscillation ENSO, known to trigger extreme climate fluctuations, is entering its hot phase. The presence of El Nino conditions in June signifies additional heat is making its way to the surface of the Pacific Ocean, further elevating the global temperature. As this intensifies, it's believed that more records will be broken in the upcoming year and a half. One researcher has even said that July could well be the hottest month in well over 100,000 years. Alongside this record-breaking day, 2023's June has been confirmed as the hottest ever recorded with global average temperatures hitting 1.46 degrees Celsius above the average that was recorded between 1850 and 1900. This exceptional warmth is present across the globe, with the July temperature record in Antarctica being broken with a reading of 8.7 degrees Celsius at Ukraine's Vernadsky research base. Some troubling, if not unexpected, news about the health of our planet. And now over to Ben with some interesting news about an old friend. Thanks, Doug. First up in the paleontology news for this week, we have the amazing discovery of a new species of Jurassic Vampyromorph. This fossil comes from a mid-Jurassic aged formation in France that's well known for its exceptionally well-preserved soft-bodied organisms, even preserving three-dimensional soft tissues. This new paper utilizes X-ray-based imaging techniques as well as other methods in order to study this new specimen, finding incredible details of an ink sac as well as internal light organs within this animal. Vampyromorphs are an ancient lineage of cephalopods with just one living member, the vampire squid. However, they are actually close relatives of octopuses and are not true squid at all. Ink sacs and light organs are present in the modern representative of this lineage and act as defensive mechanisms. However, they have never been identified in a fossil vampyromorph before now. So this is a pretty exciting discovery. The musculature of the arms and anatomy of the sucker attachments could even be examined, which is just amazing. And based on the anatomy of the gladius, the hard internal body part of the animal, this specimen has been named as a new genus and species, Vampyra fugians atramentum. So this wonderful discovery adds to the known diversity of these animals, and shows that cephalopods were occupying lots of different niches in the mid-Jurassic seas. Also in the news for this week, there's a very interesting new study that has completely upturned what we thought we knew about the ecology of Anomalocaris. Anomalocaris canadensis is famous for its incredible anatomy and is known from fossils dating back to the Cambrian period, over 500 million years ago. The best known site for these fossils is the Burgess Shale of the Canadian Rockies, and you may have heard the story of how this animal was at first thought to have been many different organisms, with the mouth parts and frontal appendages of Anomalocaris looking like parts of different invertebrates, but eventually they were all realised to have come from a single species. Anomalocaris is a stem group arthropod, meaning they belong to a completely extinct lineage related to all living arthropods, and it's been thought for a long time that it was a demersal predator, meaning it hunted near the sea floor. Evidence for the feeding style of Anomalocaris was thought to have been found, as fossils of trilobites that inhabited the ocean floor have injuries seemingly consistent with the damage that can be inflicted by Anomalocaris appendages. And so this animal has long been interpreted as an apex predator of bottom-dwelling trilobites and other hard-shelled organisms. However, there has been some disagreement among paleontologists as to whether Anomalocaris would really have been able to use its frontal appendages to process biomineralized prey. So this new study applies various techniques to investigate the structural capabilities of Anomalocaris anatomy, with some very interesting results. Despite some recent studies showing that the frontal appendages were very flexible and therefore could have been used to crush hard shells, the results of this research show that, although the frontal appendages could have been used to capture prey, they were incapable of crunching through biomineralized shells and would have deformed if they'd done this. 
However, it was also found that when these appendages were outstretched in front of the animal, they produced very little drag, and so very fast bursts of speed were possible. In addition to evidence from the mouth parts, the anatomy of the eyes, the tail fan and the body flaps, this has been taken as evidence to show that instead of being a predator of hard-shelled prey such as trilobites that swam slowly near the sea floor, Anomalocaris was in fact a swift-moving predator that predated on soft-bodied organisms higher up in the water column where there was more light. Other relatives of Anomalocaris were probably the ones to have fed on hard-shelled prey, explaining those injuries on the trilobites, and also showing how Anomalocaris and its relatives were adapting to lots of different niches in the Cambrian oceans. Well, that's it for the paleontology news this week. Back to Doug in the studio. Thank you, Ben. Well, that's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you next week.